Hey, greetings everybody. It is GleeCon, and we are back once again with another episode of Lore of Warcraft. I am happy to be here, and we are going to pipe some more lore into your ears this time as we continue our alternating pattern where we play the game half the time and then we talk about some lore the other half. On our last episode, we took Erator, our human paladin, and having just recently finished the Dead Mines, he stuck around in Westfall and did a paladin quest where he had to protect, um, I don't think it was an actual paladin, I think it's a guy, just a, a faithful, a devout dude that has ties to the church and protected his wife while he's off doing whatever. It turns out, I believe, it turns out I think he's in, I don't remember if he, uh, he was in Ironforge, that's what he was, he's just kind of patrolling but he's also maybe like a blacksmith well he set us on a path for major um a major paladin quest line which is probably the most extensive quest line i've seen for anything in this game so far i thought it's 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 close to on par with some of the worst ones I've seen in Burning Crusade were, which I thought were just extreme. And that's because I guess I didn't realize these type of quests were removed. I think they removed most, if not all of these class quests. Um, what it entails is running through about half of Deadmines, um, which I did accomplish step one. It's a four step process. I accomplished step one off camera. As soon as we finished the last episode, I ran another Deadline, Deadmines, we've already ran it with Erator. There was no need. There's nothing special. Um, you had to get the wood. It's like iron wood. So the, the second boss where you fight the Shredder boss, the goblin that's in the Shredder that jumps off, which we did on camera before, from that point on, you'll fight goblin woodworkers, among other things. Those goblin woodworkers, pretty much the first one you kill will drop the wood. So it's just a matter of getting up to the second boss. Uh, so not something you can really solo, just might as well pick up a group for dead mines. We still have three steps left. I'm gonna next I'm gonna do is step two where you have to go to Loch Modon. Not that crazy of a journey for old Erator, and you go to the elite ogre camp area, and I don't even think it's hard to get to them. At this level, he should be able to solo a few of those ogres without too much trouble, and he should be able to access the ore. Um the third the third part of it and fourth part are going to be much more extensive and as i get closer to them i'll talk with uh, about my trials and tribulations accomplishing that but almost all of it is things that steps that can happen off camera but i'll i'll let you know what we're, we're missing out on on the channel so for now all i did was rerun dead mines and quick drop of the uh wood so nothing really doing i don't i wouldn't recommend trying to solo it unless you feel comfortable soloing your way past that there's no way to do it without fighting the first boss so you'd have to solo your way past the first boss and get to the second boss i just ran the dungeon a whole second time i actually healed it uh not my ideal role for erator but it was fine the tank was not that great so they died a couple times but because i'm a paladin i could res and everybody else was fine Okay, so we've also been reading through the Monster Guide, this Dungeons and Dragons source book, and we're getting really close. Uh, we still have over we, 100 pages left in the book, and I don't know what it's all going to be taken up with because we're already on tease. So stay a while and listen. If, you, if you've already made it this far, you're staying a while as we continue, starting with tease. And we're going to look at the Tar Beasts first. And there are two kinds they list here, Tar Beasts and Tar Lords. We know there are other types of monsters that fit this template. Um lower than a challenge rating six and seven that they show here it says these first appear or the feet appears in the mystery yeah. but um this was our first elite that we had to camp for a drop quest in uh teldrassil fighting one of these guys bog lords or whatever a not bog lords those are different that's from burning crusade uh whatever you want to call these guys a black viscous creature draped with trailing green moss oozes slowly across the ground. Its hide appears slick, taut, and rubbery, and the creature forms and retracts small pseudopods as it moves. Any face it might possess is hidden under the veil of moss. In the steamy bowl of the Ungoro crater, the enigmatic tar beasts rise from bubbling black tar pits to destroy those who cross them. 
Also found in warm swamps, tar beasts are primal elementals born of the land. Few travelers ever see a tar beast unless they somehow anger the monster, in which case they feel the unbridled wrath of the elemental. As tar beasts are quiet, reclusive, and unspeaking, no one quite knows what will anger one. Oh, we also fought a version of these in Fenris Isle around there when we were grinding for some, I don't know, even some kind of roots or something like that. Some scholars theorize that primal forces of nature inhabit and animate tar beasts. The fact that such creatures almost always form in extremely ancient primitive locations bears this theory out, though it certainly proves little. Others claim that the spirits of deceased dinosaurs trapped and drowned in tar pits animate the elementals. No one knows for sure. Tar creatures seem to understand common and calamag, which seems to indicate that the creatures are not dinosaur spirits, but they don't speak. There you go. So the concept of them being, they're already contradicting themselves. Uh, who knows? I would say, yeah, sure. They're probably just some kind of elemental force, a primal magical force that's animated and given some sentience to some plant-like tar like creature. Tar beasts begin combat by hurling blobs at their nearest foes. When an enemy closes in, the tar beast engages that enemy only until it becomes stuck in the tar creature's adhesive skin. Then the tar beast shifts its focus to the next closest enemy, so they can adhere those that they touch, kind of like a grappling type of thing. The blob they shoot um, basically ties you to the ground, and they have swamp walk, which means that um, they can't be blocked if you control swamps as your black mana producing card. <laughs> Uh, Magic the Gathering joke. Um, <laughs> no, it just means they move around good in swamps. They move good in swamp. Tar Lord. Powerful tar beasts are sometimes referred to as tar lords. This tar lord represents a tar beast advanced five hit die. Okay. So, yeah, they're just tough. Same everything else. They just have tougher stuff. They're bigger and nothing, nothing different whatsoever. Thistle shrubs. All right, we don't have a picture probably till the next page. So let's see if we can figure out what is a thistle shrub based on description. Uh, their challenge rating is seven. So they're about this, as powerful as a tar lord. This knotted patch of cactus-like briars shudders and begins to move. It forms massive gnarled arms covered in wicked thorns. Thistle shrubs are exceptionally hardy ambulatory plants that meander about the desert seeking sources of water close to the surface. Mindless, they seek out other living creatures in order to drain liquids and minerals from their bodies. Thistle shrubs often hide among normal plants so that they appear to be nothing more than a few twisted brambles or vines. They absorb all moisture from the ground, holding it within their bodies in special dew glands. Because they take all nearby sources of moisture for themselves, thereby killing other plants, most consider them ecological menaces to be destroyed on sight. Even druids tend to have little compunction about putting down these destructive creatures. A typical thistle shrub stands 12 feet high and 8 feet wide, and they weigh 800 pounds. It makes me, okay, I'm having an inkling that these appear around Tanaris, based on what they're talking about with the deserts, but I could be wrong. Could be a Tanaris, Silithus type of creature. But it also could be Desolus, somewhere around there. Thistle shrubs immobilize any moving foe with roots, then move it and pound their prey to death. A thistle shrub always attacks the foe with the most fluid, usually the largest one. They ignore constructs and creatures with no water content unless such creatures attack them first. They can uh, poison. Oh, they look exactly like the other thing. Look, they're from the same template. And so are these things. So tar beast, so even though they're the same template, like tar beasts are the Ungoro crater version. What the hell did I do? I jumped to the end. Dang it. I don't know why I Agnabbit. Uh, and I, I don't know how I managed to skip like 80 pages specifically. Annoying. Okay, so tar beasts are the Ungoro crater version of the thistle shrub. This must be the Tanaris or whatever version. These timberlings are the ones we fought at the beginning of the game. Um, these guys also have poison thorns. Yeah, so it just gives them their poison, but they also, if you, oh, so if you strike them, you take damage from them, and they can root you down like entangle. Timberling are the the weak versions we fought in Teldrassil. 
and I guess maybe some kind of bog monster. These could be the Fenris Isle. These are challenge ratings one and four, whether it's a Timberling or a Swamp Walker. The twisted mass of branches, vines, and leaves lumbers forward, rustling with each step. Its body has a vaguely humanoid shape. Timberlings are mobile plants that live in swamps or alongside rivers or lakes. They are normally pe peaceful creatures that live in harmony with the land, but any sort of disruption, such as pollution, drives them into an unnatural frenzy. An angered timberling attacks anything that moves. Timberlings can be made peaceful again only by removing the source of their discomfort and returning the land to its natural state. Timberlings attack by forming their woody limbs into fist-like appendages and they strike a foe. They leave behind a clump of shoots that expands rapidly, enhancing weaknesses in the victim's defenses. Timberlings stand four feet high and weigh 50 pounds. They do not speak or understand any known languages. They attack the nearest enemy, pummeling until the foe stops moving. They have the piercing shoots, which basically it rends armor. Um, they're amphibious. We fought some others that also make you slippery, uh, they make you fall down when you hit, they can disarm you, Those, so this, they do. They basically, their hits have some sort of status debuff usually. Swamp walkers are similar to timberlings but are a darker green in color. They dwell almost exclusively in swamps, defending their territory from any intruders. A swamp walker is naturally stealthy and usually lurks just under the surface of the water, lashing out at any creature that comes near. Swamp walkers stand seven feet high and weigh 300 pounds. They can flatten themselves down to as short as two feet, usually to hide in brambles or underwater. Swamp walkers attack indiscriminately, lurching toward any opponent within range. They particularly loathe fire and go after anyone holding or wielding a flame, no matter how small or inoffensive the flame may seem. This seems like maybe that's like a wetlands type of thing you're going to fight. They have entangling shoots as well. Maybe some of the other swamps. They have swamp regeneration, so if they're in the swamp, they regenerate and a swamp sense so they are just aware of anyone that's in their swamp within a certain range and they're good at sneaking and hiding in the swamp all right the big bad trogs that actually surprisingly um very important to the lore they just keep hanging around i don't know what their backstory is this is a challenge rating one and they have this table up here which means you could hypothetically create um, NPCs or PCs with the Trog template. This creature is a grotesque parody of a dwarf with oversized bent head, bent spine, arms that drag along the ground, and a mouth filled with ragged oversized teeth. It wears rough smelly highs and carries a crude club covered with spatters of blood. Uh, that's generous to call that a club. It's uh, It looks like a bone to me. Trogs have a distinctly Neanderthal look, low sloping forehead, thick covered with bristly black hairs and the long arms and bent spines of an ape. They are dull-witted and savage, but possess a ferocious cunning that makes them dangerous despite their lack of civilization. Trogs are related to dwarves, but if anything, the two races are distant cousins. Some legends say that both dwarves and trogs descended from the original earthen race left behind by the titans after the world was shaped in ages past. While the dwarves evolved into the stocky creatures known today, the trogs retained a stronger connection to the stone from which they were made. For reasons not yet fully understood, the trogs' evolutionary path led them to their present state. Crude, stupid creatures only barely above the level of beasts, and they're covered in, like, sores. They're gross. Trogs look and act nothing like their distant cousins, however. They dwell in rocky areas but don't mind living above ground if they must. They eat just about anything, supplementing their diet of plants and raw meat with the dirt and rocks they crush between powerful flat teeth. The resulting gravel helps with digestion and is partially absorbed into their bodies, increasing their toughness. Hmm. Trogs stand about five feet tall in their normal hunched over state, but if they draw themselves fully erect, they exceed six feet in height. They weigh around 300 pounds. Trogs do not speak, but can make themselves understood with guttural growls and grunts. Trogs lack subtlety in combat, or in anything else for that matter. They typically rush toward the closest opponent and bash it over the head until it dies, then move on to the next victim. A trog usually begins combat by raging if it has that ability. And poor, poor Mil Maleficent, she's the one, Maleficent, she died to a trog. She was our last hardcore attempt. She died to a trog. Um, she, they have a rage of the earth ability, so it's like a berserk rage. Um, they have dark vision, 
They can just use their fists as a natural weapon. They do gain bonuses to strength and stamina, but major penalties to intellect and charisma. Um, they have a natural bonus to armor class and intimidate. And they like to be barbarians. They can, they don't speak any language, but they can be trained in common, dwarven, or low common if they get any intelligence at all. As they level up, they just get ferocity, rage, extra natural armor. And, okay, on to Ice Trolls. Because we've already talked about every other kind of troll under the sun. This is a challenge rating 1. Even though there's no template, I think it's just because the only place you really fight them is in Dune Morog. This troll has blue-white skin under grayish leather armor, and he sports a red mohawk. That's not red, it's white. Ice Trolls are a subspecies of troll that lives in cold climates. They have angular features, bright blue eyes, and mottled blue-white skin covered in hides and pelts. Like most trolls, ice trolls are evil beings. They practice cannibalism and sometimes eat their slain enemies raw. Their spellcasters wield voodoo and their culture is primitive and tribal. Also, like other trolls, ice trolls seek to reclaim their lost empires. They have a particular hatred for Ironforge dwarves who they believe drove them out of their lands in ages past. Ice trolls and Cosmodon take advantage of the current chaos there to strike against their ancient enemies. Ice trolls like to get to grips with their enemies and most throw themselves into melee combat. Ice Troll spellcasters stay behind to cast spells. Some Ice Troll warlords are charismatic and savvy enough to impose more sophisticated tactics on their warriors. And they, it says this uses the elite array, so they can be made into characters. But I guess there's not a lot going on here, because they're, they would be similar to regular trolls. Um, it says they, they're generally evil... Um, they can be purchased as mercenaries. They enjoy killing. Some make their way as slaves or mercenaries throughout the world. They like to be barbarians or shamans or witch doctors. Other than that, this is why, because it basically just says they are just like jungle trolls. So they don't give anything new. They're like, if you want to be this fine, just call yourself an ice troll and use the jungle troll stats. Okay, there's also Sand Fury Trolls, which we're, they're just getting a little description here. In the deserts of Southern Kalimdor live a tribe of brown-skinned trolls with tough hides able to withstand the driving sands of the desert winds. They call themselves Sand Fury Trolls, and much else about them is a mystery. Most scholars think them a small and anomalous offshoot of the more common troll races. Sand Fury Trolls use the statistics of Ice Trolls, except instead of the cold subtype, they have resistance to Fire 5, and they don't have low-light vision. There's also Drakari and Zandalar trolls. Unlike some other troll tribes, a group of ice trolls still retains a portion of its kingdom. The Drakari live in Zuldrak in Northrend. These are larger and stronger than ice trolls elsewhere, and indeed almost all other trolls averaging 8 feet in height. Zandalar trolls are the progenitor race from which other trolls came. They are just as large and strong as Drakari trolls. Drakari use the same statistics as other ice trolls with the following modifications. Zandalari, though they are not tr jungle trolls, they are Zandalar trolls, use the same statistics as jungle trolls with the following modification. So both of these are bigger, so they get an extra plus two strength. But because they're so big, they lose. They have a penalty to armor class, attack, hiding, but bonuses to grappling and carrying limits. And they are treated as one level higher than they are because they're a little tougher. All right, so we're completely skipping over use. I think this might be the first le letter that we're skipping. There are no monsters... That begin with a U, and we're going right to V's with Void Walkers. It's a challenge rating 3 creature. This hulking blue creature looks vaguely humanoid. It seems to appear from within a black cloud as dark as the Void. The lovable characters that, uh, or, or companions that most solo adventuring warlocks come to rely on. Voidwalkers are demons created from the chaos of the Twisting Nether. Their touch is misery, and it can momentarily blind a creature to other threats. A Voidwalker's sole purpose is to unconditionally serve a master. Thus, travelers rarely encounter them alone. A Voidwalker is often a warlock's choice fell companion for its ability to intercept a single foe and keep him or her occupied. Many warlocks also prefer to do without the mischievousness of an imp or the jealousy of a succubus, preferring instead the unwavering, silent loyalty of a Voidwalker. Voidwalkers understand, but do not speak Eridun. 
A Voidwalker does not hesitate to follow even the most suicidal commands its master gives. A Voidwalker's master often sends it to block a threat, leaving the master free to cast spells or use other abilities without interference. A Voidwalker takes its orders literally. When out of communication with its master, it continues to obey its last command, even if that command is tactically unsound. Tor they have a tormenting strike. Um, basically, they it's a taunt. This is their taunting move. Um, they have bracers, much like elementals, so if their bracers are somehow destroyed, they, they, there's a large chance they're banished, and if they're not banished, they're severely weakened. They can consume shadows, as in the game, um, which lets it heal itself. They have damage reduction um, against good and true silver weapons, and spell resistance. So they're tough little tanks. They have no offensive moves. All right, that was the only V, and now we're jumping to W's with the Wendigos. We have the Wendigos, challenge rating 4, and the stronger Yeti is challenge rating 7. This tall, muscular humanoid is covered in shaggy fur. Its feet and clawed hands are huge, and a pair of deadly horns crowns its head. Wendigo are bestial, cave-dwelling humanoids. Bestial? Bestial. Barely intelligent, these creatures prefer to remain hidden when travelers pass close to their territory. A, a Wendigo's behavior turns aggressive, however, if a visitor overstays his welcome or threatens the Yeti's family. It is possible for a small tribe of Wendigo to go unnoticed by a nearby community for years. The townsfolk may tell tales of beastmen living in the woods, but few residents, if any, see one directly. Wendigo living in close proximity are not necessarily a threat, and rumors say that some adopt to protect small villages, eliminating dangers from the shadows. Huh. An adult Wendigo stands well over seven feet tall and weighs about 1,200 pounds. Actually, in dra uh, Shadow... No, yeah, in Dragonflight, there, I think there's a story over by the Tuscar of, like, a positive Wendigo. A Wendigo prefers to avoid combat altogether, but once angered, just about the only way to stop it is to slay the beast. Also, what's weird and classic is that you can skin them. Gross. They have a rend, which if they hit with both attacks, they get like a bonus messed up attack. And um, they're good at scouting and hiding in the snow. Yeti are cousins to Wendigo. They live in colder climates far away from civilized communities. Yeti are far more territorial and aggressive than Wendigo, usually attacking intruders on sight. A Yeti begins combat with its breath weapon and then closes into melee, attacking fiercely. Its breath weapon is a big cone of cold, but it also has the um, rend and it can hide and stuff. All right, Wildkin. Wildkin are challenge rating 6, and the Owl Beasts are a bit stronger at 8. This silver-furred creature appears to be a sort of bear at first glance, but its head resembles that of a bird and antlers rise from its head. Green and gold feathers trail down its limbs, making them look like miniature wings. Its golden eyes hold wisdom and kindness, but its beak and claws appear razor sharp. The Wildkin, a half bear, half owl, acts as a powerful force for good and a staunch ally of the Night Elves. While good-tempered and wise, the Wildkin fights fiercely against evildoers, especially undead the forces of the Burning Legion. Most Wildkin treat peaceful travelers with respect, sometimes coming to their aid or assisting lost visitors of, out of their forests. They ferociously attack hostile creatures on sight. Night Elves claim that Elune created the first Wildkin in the early days of the world to serve as guardians to Cenarius. She combined the best traits of the Owl, the most beloved of her nightbirds, and the Bear, the lumbering protector of the woods. The result, a swift, elegant, and fiercely loyal hunter. That is not elegant at all. Lately, adventurers traveling through the hinterlands report strange wildkin attacks. The wildkin seem confused, even maddened, and attack relentlessly and randomly. Some also have mutations, such as deformed limbs, scabbed pelts with large bald patches, or red eyes. No one knows how this wildkin corruption began. Adult wildkin grow to a height of 10 to 12 feet and weigh over 1,000 pounds. They mate for life and bear fuzzy gray cubs that do not develop their claws and brilliant pl plumage until two or three years of age. Night Elves consider the shimmering pelts and golden eyes of the Wildkin to be beautiful. Wildkin do not speak, but they understand Arnassian. I think we've encountered some that speak. And there's also, in Darkshore, we have also pretty much, I think it's rare to find Wildkin that aren't crazed and wanting to fight you. Also, look at their big ears. They have like Night Elf ears. That's not a bear ear or an owl ear. What the heck is that? Your weird scaly legs. 
Once Wildkin choose to attack, they are ferocious and relentless. A badly injured Wildkin may retreat and pursue enemies later once it heals. They grab, they rage out, and then the, yeah, they fight. <laughs> this creature seems, uh, this is owl, owl beast. They seem part bear, part owl. Its white feathered chest turns to dark brown fur along its muscled arms. A yellowed beak juts from below its round eyes. A great rack of antlers sprouts from its head. Which is crazy, because in Dungeons & Dragons, there are straight up owl bears. So they, it's weird how um, Blizzard was like, Let's do that, but call it an L beast and make it weirder and freakier. Like, this is so much less cool than an actual owlbear. But whatever, they're iconic now. They're part of, like, World of Warcraft. But um, just if I was to look at a picture of this and look at an owlbear, I'd be like, what was this guy on? <laughs> owl beasts, larger and more powerful cousins of wildkin, seem derived from the same species, but their origins remain shrouded in mystery. The Night Elves claim that Elune also created the Owl Beasts to serve as her guardians, but Owl Beasts do not possess the gentle natures of Wildkin. Owl Beasts embody chaos over good, then fly into uncontrolled rages in combat. No one knows what sets off an Owl Beast's wrath, so cautious adventurers give the creatures a wide berth. Some Owl Beasts in the Hinterlands exhibit the same corrupted mutations as their Wildkin cousins in that region. Yeah, what's even the difference? I see, so I guess the ones we're fighting all the time are Owl Beasts and not Wildkin. Owl beasts grow to almost 20 feet tall and weigh 3,000 pounds or more. Whoa, they're huge. They prefer colder climates than do wildkin, and as, as a result, they develop white or silver feathers in the snowy season. Like wildkin, they do not speak, but they understand Arnassian. Owl beasts attack relentlessly and fearlessly. They fly into a frenzy immediately upon entering combat and then fight to the death. They have an improved grab and a full-on berserk. Okay, withered creatures. This is a template that we can give them. The Lich King bolstered the ranks of the Scourge through necromancy that left in its wake. The twisted, withered husks of once mortal creatures now horribly transformed into malicious undead servants. Such withered creatures retain their intelligence, their special abilities, and sometimes, and most disturbingly, their memories. Some are maddened creatures, longing for their old lives but forever barred from that path, taking, over, taking out their resentment on the living. Others wallow in despair, repulsed by their forms but forced to bear them waiting patiently and hopelessly for the sweet release of destruction. Still others revel in their new powers, embracing their new lives, their new unlives, with an insane fervor. The only constant among the withered is that none of them remains unchanged by the touch of Nerjul. So yet another undead template. This is the third or fourth one. While the Scourge created the first withered creatures, other types of withered creatures have since come into existence. In some cases, those who die violent deaths at the hands of undead raise spontaneously as withered creatures. Particularly evil beings sometimes find themselves cursed after death, unable to get to rest quiet in the grave. Greedy folk who cling to life with both hands sometimes attain a withered state through sheer force of will. Necromancers who traffic with the forces of life and death can rise as withered creatures after death, and some seek out the transformation deliberately. No two withered creatures look exactly alike. Most retain their mortal forms, yet with a dry, dead look about them as if they were empty husks. Some lose their flesh entirely, remaining as animated skeletons. Others rot continually, shedding slick white flesh and writhing maggots in their wake, but somehow never losing mass. Most bear glowing eyes, usually yellow, red, or green, and certain similar abilities as listed below. Okay, so withered is a template that can be added to any aberration, animal, dragon, fey, giant, humanoid, magic beast, monstrous, humanoid, plant, or vermin, so almost anything. They typically stay the same, except their type changes to undead. Their hit dice is, becomes the best because they're undead. Their speed is good unless they can fly, that drops. They gain extra armor. Um, they do gain an extra base attack if they decide to not use their weapons just like undead do. They have a full attack if they want to fight without weapons. Um, the, the damage as listed here, they gain some special attacks. They have a breath weapon. Um, oh, if they had a breath weapon, they still have it. And it's going to become cold type. So this kind of makes me think almost of like the dragon liches. Rothide Knoll is our sample. So if in the back of your head, if you're trying to think what's a withered, I guess the Rothide Knoll is one. 
um, they can create spawn because their 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 condition is contagious. They poison. If they had poison, they now have a new supernatural poison um, based on list those listed here. They do have damage reduction and immunity to cold. So let's look at this rot hide knoll. It's a challenge rating four. At first glance, this creature seems to be a common knoll, but further inspection reveals that its withered skin stretches tightly over prominent bones. Rotted flesh shows beneath its patchy fur and its eyes glow dark red. Rot hide knolls combine the strength and aggression of regular knolls amplified by their undead status with a lack of the cowardice that knolls often exhibit. Rot hide knolls possess little intelligence and even less subtlety. They charge into battle using their power attack feet to its fullest degree and randomly change targets from round to round. That's always fun to like role play when you are the DM. Um, they do gain bonuses to, to a big bonus to strength, but everything else basically they drop agility and have huge drops to intelligence and charisma. Um, they become if they used to be able to be good with animals, they aren't anymore. And everything else is pretty much the same. They become a little bit tougher. They become evil. All right, now we're on to wargs. Uh, we fought these right out there in the world. The challenge rating four. A red tongue lolls from beneath the fanged jaws of this wolf-like beast. Double the size of a regular wolf, this creature nonetheless pads along the ground with a swift, deadly grace. I think these are like the mounts of the orcs. Wargs are cunning predators closely related to wolves, but larger and with greater intelligence. They grow to 10 feet long and weigh over 1,000 pounds. Like normal wolves, their pelts range in color from pitch black to gray and even snowy white. Wargs live for the hunt both for the sheer joy of it and because their large bodies require large amounts of meat. Some humanoid races value wargs as steeds due to their increased intellect, but a wargs foul disposition turns away many trainers. Instinctive pack hunters, wargs prefer to attack in tandem. They enjoy surrounding an opponent, tripping him up, and then attacking relentlessly as he tries to ride. A badly wounded warg usually flees, and they trip in their ornery, which makes them tough to, trandle, to handle. All right, worgen. Um, my main is a worgen. I like them. They are one of my favorite uh, races, but here we have them listed because they aren't playable yet, so they're just enemies. Regular work on challenge rating three, tainted ones go up to four. The humanoid lopes along on all fours, half man, half wolf. The wicked looking claws on its hands look quite capable of cutting people to ribbons. Worgen are not native to Azeroth and have only recently appeared in remote areas where they menace travelers and small settlements. Some believe they are arrivals from another world in the Twisting Nether, while others think they might have been created through magical experimentation or brought here as servants of some evil entity. Whatever the case, they're most unwelcome. We just discussed that when we did all the lore behind Shadow Fang Keep. These creatures are thoroughly evil, delighting in torturing and devouring intelligent creatures. They enjoy hearing the screams of their victims as they tear them apart piece by piece. Worgen never show mercy or remorse. They may seem savage, but they're fairly intelligent and possess a cruel bestial cunning that can come as a surprise to the unprepared. Worgen society is patriarchal, with the eldest male leading the pack. Worgen never challenge leadership. The patriarch leads until he's physically incapable of doing so any longer, at which point his younger kin devour him. The Worgen see this not as cruelty, but a great honor. They consume the bodies of their fallen as well as their victims. They believe the flesh and blood of their own kind improves their strength and cunning. I think a lot of this is retconned, and especially, well, I don't think it has to be retconned so hard as it because the worgen from Gilnius are different. They have kind of broken free and, and retained consciousness. Reattained it. Worgen look like humanoid wolves. They dwell in simple huts and usually wear cured leather scraps and rudimentary armor. Worgen do not use weapons, preferring to tear foes apart with their claws. They stand six feet tall except when loping on all fours and weigh around 250 pounds. They speak their own language, made up of a variety of growls, barks, and howls. Worgen love nothing more than to pounce on an opponent and tear him to ribbons. If a foe is helpless, the Worgen delivers a coup de grace before moving on to another target, unless the fight is well in hand. Then it turns to torture or playtime, and the unfortunate victim is almost certain to wish he had died. They pounce, they have a serrated claw which causes uh, bleeding, they have an uncanny dodge ability. Those are cool. Um, love them. Tainted ones are worgen with exceptionally vicious claws and improved combat abilities. They look almost identical to standard worgen, except that they are perhaps a bit taller while standing erect. 
An opponent typically doesn't know he's facing a tainted one instead of a regular worgen until his foe howls. Tainted ones stand almost 7 feet high, weigh up to 300 pounds. Tainted ones usually charge an opponent and then howl in his face. They also have the serrated claw. They have a tainted howl, which um, it's actually, it buffs them. And, oh, and any it buffs them while enemies, it has a chance to make them shaken. Okay, we're, re we're nearing the end. We have Wraiths here. It's challenge rating 5. This wispy and substantial blue figurine radiates numbing cold. Tendrils of translucent white hair frame a face twisted in hate. Wraiths, angry and violent spirits, long for a return to mortal life and vent their jealous rage on living creatures. While possessed by a constant desperate fury, wraiths nonetheless possess the intellect and self-control to deal rationally if grudgingly with mortal beings on occasion. Wraiths speak the language as they did in life. Wraiths begin a combat by using their spell-like abilities. They attempt to dominate or possess anyone who appears unable uh, to turn undead. Freaking out there. Okay, good. I just had my same my characteristic episode freak out where I'm like, am I recording? Next, they target an enemy's force, enemy force's apparent leaders. Should the domination and possession fail, a wraith instead curses these targets. Only after she's expended all her spell-like abilities does the wraith enter melee combat with her cold touch. She creates spawn. If she slays them, she can possess, much like in World of Warcraft, or, or just much like in Warcraft 3. And she casts a Banshee's Curse, Dominate Person, and she has an unnatural aura, which makes animals not want to come near her. So I wasn't sure if we're going to stop at W's, what I was going to do, but I'm going to push on because we skip X's, we skip Y's, and my guess is Zombie is probably the only Z we're going to have. So this is probably our last creature, but we still have 100 pages of the book, so... We've probably got a big chunk of appendices left ahead of us. Zombies are nothing more than animated corpses. Zombies are often brought to horrifying unlife to serve as frontline troops for the Lich King's armies. Zombies are often plague carriers, infested with all manner of parasitic creatures. Their bodies are in a suspended state of decay, their flesh perpetually sloughing away or peeling aside to reveal bone and desiccated organs. Of all the undead, zombies are one of the more horrific varieties, for their lack of free will is all the more apparent in their pitiable state of their bodies. Even more horrible is the fact that not all zombies lose their memories and personalities. A few zombies retain their memories, trapped within a decaying corpse compelled to serve their former enemies. Um, so, if you make a zombie, it's a template that gets applied, and they keep their size, but they, of course they become undead, and they... It says... Oh, they change those to D12s, and... Uh, I said, I see. It says you would double their hit dice, but if they have more than 10, you can't make it into a zombie. So it can take one of these other templates, but if it's too powerful, it can't be a zombie. Um, it becomes very slow and clumsy, gains extra armor, it gains a full attack with the damage listed here. Um, does get damage reduction to slashing, but they're very slow and can only do one action per round. So exactly, you wouldn't want a zombie like Dragon because... It would be not like you'd be weakening the dragon. Um, they gain strength, they lose agility, and they have no stamina or intellect. They're mindless. Their charisma drops. Um, they have no skills. They basically have no feats. Yeah, they're just mindless and lame. Um, they're just tough mountain mounds of meat that, that kind of will come towards you. All right, the sample they give us is a human zombie. It only has a challenge rating of one half. The creature was once human, but now stares ahead with dull, lifeless eyes. Bits and pieces of dead flesh hang from its body as the walking corpse slowly plods forward. Zombies are corpses animated by necromancy. Most zombies have no memories of their lives and are capable only of obeying simple commands such as attack or march. Their unthinking obedience makes them perfect tools for frontline assaults, for their plodding onslaught is both demoralizing and relentless. Rumors say that not all zombies are so lucky as to have no memories. Some retain full knowledge of their pre-death identities as well as their knowledge and skills. These memories do them no good, however, for they remain under the control of the Scourge. Forced to obey their master's commands and to suffer their existence within their own decaying corpse. These creatures are objects of pity, but no less dangerous than, the, than their mindless fellows. Zombies without memories have no speech, so they can make meaningless sounds. Intelligent zombies know the same language as they did in life and can sometimes manage halting speech. A zombie's approach to combat is simple. It attacks whatever enemy it is ordered to attack and does not stop until it is destroyed. 
Some zombies use weapons such as clubs if they have them. If not, they use their slam attack. The zombies neither attempt to dodge nor do they retreat. The zombie presented above uses the non-elite ability score array, see chapter 3, Improving Monsters. Sentient zombies. Every so often a zombie retains its intellect or develops a form of sentience over long years. No one has been able to create the circumstance intentionally, nor does anyone understand why or how it happens. The zombies that retain their sentience have the intellect, spirit, and charisma scores of the base creatures, except that the charisma score takes a minus fill for penalty because they're, they're gross. Their literally body is falling apart. They do not lose their class levels or class features. That makes me think I basically found like a zombie snake. I was in my shed the other day and uh, I saw this orange hose like laying at the back and I was like, what the heck is that? And I just like barely touched it and it was just burst open. It was this rotting, I don't even, it's been, it was been so long that it was probably at one point in time, a black snake. Um, and it had become like white and orange. And yeah, it was disgusting. <laughs> so that's what's happening to these zombies. So that's gross. They retain the skills and feats of the base creatures and gain toughness as a bonus feat. And they retain all special attacks and blah, blah, blah. Okay. So, yep, we're moving on to, I guess, some unique people after this is what we'll do on the next episode. So on the next one, we'll go with some like legendary heroes. And then again, there's other appendices after that. But all right, we have another episode of the Pipe 5x5. Five five. Thank you, everyone, so much for watching and listening. We made it through all the monsters, but we have some more to go in this book. Um, and I look forward to seeing everybody next time on the next episode of Lore of Warcraft.